you, your first job was at William Blair, an institution which you clearly didn't like and an experience you clearly didn't enjoy. And you left there without having another job, right? Do you want to just very briefly just yeah. tell us about the circumstances? Because I think there's quite a lot of lessons to learn from it's, that. Yeah, it's so many. And just to be clear, William Blair is a highly reputable um, uh, smaller brokerage firm that may still be around. And we must make sure that... Um, so all the folks at William Blair... You guys are great. <laughs> there's, there's, so, so let's just be clear. We're talking about a firm that is, I don't think, anymore in, existing, in existence, and it's called D.H. Blair. Uh, this, and, and there's no problem with you doing that because, Stephen, that is a very, very important point. What these bucket shops do is that they want to play off the perception that there's something else. So they would name themselves, they would take the name of a well-known firm and, you know, instead of calling themselves Goldman Sachs, they'd call themselves Geldman Zox. Believe it or not, oh. that there would be people who'd be duped by that. And it's just kind of insane. And in a certain way, you made the exact mistake that the people at D.H. Blair wanted you to make. Well, you know what I did was when I was writing up my notes, I actually... I, I've got a friend at William Blair. Right. And we were, we were meant to be meeting up for a drink. And obviously that was in my mind yeah. as I was as I was writing the notes. So Isn't my that profuse scary? apologies to William Blair. Yeah, who but might, that, might even become clients. So but you it, know. it makes a really, really important point yeah. that uh, a friend and my and I have played around with. So the mind creates positive associations. It's not very good at creating negative associations. So uh, we we kind of like toyed with the idea of um, writing on uh, one of our Wikipedia pages, you know, um, Guy Spear has never worked for George Soros. And it doesn't matter that there's a negative there because in the human mind, most human minds will make a positive association there. So, so D.H. Blair um, uh, is a sort of like, I wouldn't say carbon copy, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, if anybody here has watched the movie, I'm sure most people have, is a sort of an exaggeration of what happened at D.H. Blair and extraordinary misjudgment on my part and lack of judgment at age 27. So you'd think that I was, you know, that's getting a little late in the game to start to be making really big career mistakes. And I would call that a really big career mistake. And if you want to, we I've thought long and hard about what were the circumstances that came together to make such a big career mistake. But yes, I went to work at a Wolf of Wall Street type place in which the people at the firm, many of them did not have university degrees, a small number who did. It was run by a guy who was uh, actually a Harvard Business School graduate uh, who owned the firm, extremely smart and aggressive in his interpretation of the rules. And um, they were very, the whole firm was of the mindset that the marketplace and the participants in the marketplace are a resource to be exploited by playing fast and loose with the rules and being highly aggressive and burning relationships. And what's amazing is, is that um, that is a strategy for life. It, it, it works, actually. And there were people who made significant amounts of money there. I think it doesn't allow you to become Warren Buffett wealthy, but it allows people who might have had jobs running a car mechanic workshop or maybe even drug dealers or whatever it was that they were doing with maybe just a high school certificate to make them far more money than they could have ever expected to make, just like the people at Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. And um, I was fascinated by finance. And I loved, I, one of the reasons why I made the mistake is the guy gave me the title of vice president and he said, you'll be doing deals from day one. And that kind of appealed to me. And I can remember telling friends of mine that I was going to be vice president in an investment bank. And that, you know, in this sort of outer scorecard world of Harvard Business School at the time, there were some who were kind of struck with envy with that, you know. And instead of investing in myself and investing in relationships with people that could, could, I could build for the long term, I was going for this stupid external scorecard stuff. But the lessons, as you say, are, are profound and deep because I think that I saw in microcosm and in extreme ways, some th patterns that repeat themselves time and again all over Wall Street. And so uh, I have these debates with my father about whether it was a good idea to go there, and he thinks it was. I still think it was a terrible idea. There were other ways to learn those lessons. And the worst part is, is that I really did have a, a reputational hole to fill. And I think that you know, the younger you are when you make reputational mistakes, the better. You, you People will give you the benefit of the doubt. But the older you are when you make them, 
the more time it's going to take for people to really kind of like start trusting mm. you. Why did your dad say that it was a good idea for you to go? I mean, just a I mean, lesson, but, but, lesson you know, learned? Com coming, when I saw, I mean, just to give examples of what was standard practice, you'd take these companies public with no earnings and just a projection and a, obviously a highly charismatic salesperson. That's, that works well. <laughs> as a CEO. And you would wrap these kind of like uh, uh, options into the security that allowed it to be unraveled at some point. And you would have a bid ask spread of, you know, you take the company public at five, but the bid was at four. And, you know, unsuspecting retail investors didn't think much of that, but you're actually taking a bid ask spread of 20%, which is just enormous, not mm -hmm. to mention the fact that the company took an underwriting fee and it also took options. And so you, they were taking money every which way. And... Um, uh, so, so, but, but that allowed me to, to see what was going on, for example, in my father's bank account with his Swiss bank, where kind of I started asking about the fees, and the, and they said, well, um, uh, well, actually they're very low. I remember this banker saying because we just charge a custodial fee, and I remember looking at the the brokerage statement, and and I was telling my father they are you're receiving a bond coupon, and they've charged you a processing fee for the bond coupon. Where on earth does a bond coupon require a processing fee? And uh, my father came and asked the question. He actually brought me to one of the meetings, and they kind of hummed and hawed. So I, I had now, and my father had this approach to a banker that they're a bit like a doctor, you know. And you really do trust a doctor to give um, a professional opinion. And he felt like it should be the same at a bank. And I started telling my father stories <laughs> about how I worked at a bank, and these people were all. You know, I mean, there was a famous expression. You probably know this. Some people who've worked, quote, on Wall Street, as a rip, they, you would have brokers on the 14th, 15th floor who would boast about ripping the client's face off. You know, <laughs> wow. So, um, so it was. It was in a way. It was also a learning curve. I mean, we were immigrants. My father had grown up in Israel. My mother on a on a kibbutz, on a, not a kibbutz, on a moshav, but in a sort of like socialist environment. My mother had grown up in South Africa. And so I think that we as a family were going up a learning curve and becoming more deeply understanding of sophisticated things like financial markets. And he was going up a learning curve. So, um, so yeah, I, so he feels like because of my experience at D.H. Blair, um, he went up that learning curve. I think he would have gone up that learning curve if I'd gone to work at Goldman Sachs, which probably if I'd continued with the interviews would have been an option for me. But... I was just too desperate to get off the train tracks. You know, that was another part of me. Well, I, Go Goldman Sachs are also good at extracting money from their from their from their but, clients. But, but I but apologise again to William Blair, which uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm actually a big fan of. That was D. H. Blair. But your your dad gave you a million dollars to invest, and and later with two associates gave you fifteen million dollars. Yeah. Uh, why did he trust you with so much money, or was it not a meaningful? No, that was, very, that, was, that was very meaningful. That was everything. So what, that was, why did he do that? Um, I ask myself the question to this day. You know, he's around. You could ask him. He might, he might give you an answer. Oh, we, might um, do a, we might do a postscript. We'll do a Zoom call with your dad. That'd I mean, you cool. know, I, I've just been lucky enough to spend time with him over the last couple of days. And um, he's a very different personality to me uh, in that. So I am I am good with numbers relatively but i'm not that good on the eq side at least not compared to him and he on the other on, on the other hand is just amazing with relationships but uh and I, you know I, maybe not as good at numbers as i am uh something like that but he also had some pretty amazing amazing he was a farm boy wasn't up to much, but somehow the Israeli military saw leadership qualities in him and took him and put him through an officer's course and put him into various leadership positions in the Israeli army for the time that he was there. And um, I think that, uh, at least in his case, leadership is taking bold decisions. It's also, and I, I've learned this, you know, you, you just, you either trust somebody or you don't. And if you do trust them, plunge in with both feet and it's kind of scary but he's capable of doing that and i think that he's faced uh he, he's faced very dangerous situations where his life was at risk multiple times and he's seen friends 
die in various wars. And so I think that you have a very different approach to decision making and in a certain way risk taking. Once you've seen that, investing all of your liquid, liquid net with your son is a no brainer and just easy, I suppose. But it scared the hell out of me, it scared the living daylights out of me because I knew that there wasn't anything else around. If I got that wrong, he would be relying on his business for um, taking care of him in retirement. So, and I think that it made me more risk averse than I would have been otherwise, but perhaps I would have been very risk averse anyway. You, you write in your book that given your family's history of loss in Nazi Germany, that you're nervous about losing money, you don't like debt, and you explain that's one reason for having Berkshire in a portfolio that's balanced financially and emotionally. But you... You also write that investors need to understand their relationship with money. And with that understanding, you can make adjustments. I thought that was a very astute observation and something I hadn't previously thought about. I was wondering how you got to that conclusion. You obviously think about a great deal about how to be a better investor, how to be a better person. How do you, how do you arrive at these conclusions? I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> you know, what I'm, what I'm realizing is that we're... we're so we're both, I'm realizing now, Steve, out of the box thinkers, and that, that's kind of like a hackneyed phrase, but some people's minds don't go in straight lines. And, and I think that uh, those of us who have minds that don't go in straight lines don't understand why they don't go in straight lines. They just do. They make jumps in ways that other minds don't make. And we don't even realize that those, those jumps are unusual. But I think, that, I think that my point that you're getting at, and it, it, it's... I guess it, maybe it should be blindingly obvious is that every single individual's perspective is different. And um, well, I, I, and even before that, so, so a point that I've made many times and, and people always sort of like are surprised by it when I make it, when you read a story in the financial press that um, looks at the moves of one investor or another, most of the time those stories don't show the move in the context of the whole portfolio. The person where I think it's potentially the most uh, uh, damaging or misleading is this guy Carl Icahn, who I think has made a um, exquisite art form, if you like, of revealing some of what he's doing to the market for his purposes. But the reality is far more complex. So I, I, I remember reading somewhere that one of the things that he would do is he would he would establish a position that was neutral using options in a company. Mm -hmm. And then just do stuff to increase the volatility. You didn't know if it was going to go up or down, but it didn't matter so long as the volatility increased. And it, it appeared to people that he was either long or short, but he neutralized that out through options and he was just pushing volatility, but th that was not the agenda that he appeared to have. So not everything is what it seems to be, if you like. I've, oh, just, sure. yeah. Yeah. I've been reading a book um, that uh, is going to be coming out shortly by a guy called Chris Chabris, called Nobody's Fool. And he's the famous man behind the experiment of the gorillas, where you count the basketball players and you see the gorillas and nobody sees the gorillas the first time around. Things aren't what you see, our, our minds play tricks with us. So, um, so that perspective of you cannot really evaluate a move that somebody's made if you don't see their whole portfolio, because otherwise you're, you're just not seeing the, the whole agenda and the whole picture. And in the same way, I, I know clearly, I mean, I think that in part, just to try and answer your question a little bit better, is that at the time that I'm writing that book, I've already been spending an enormous amount of time with Monish Pabrai, and I'm seeing that he has an extraordinarily different approach to money than I do. And um, and this com comes through even things that we've been discussing recently. I mean, it's well known that he loves Turkey and I don't, for example. And um, for him... Um, I, he, I don't enjoy going to a casino and sort of like placing bets. And even with games like blackjack, I don't, and blackjack, the odds are pretty good. I mean, you can there you can argue that in certain casino tables, if you count and what have you, you can do almost as well as the house. Um, he he doesn't mind that. He doesn't mind seeing seeing the pile of chips go down for half the evening because he's using a strategy that will eventually get them back. And I just don't like that. So he clearly has a different approach to money than I do. And I started asking myself why. And I think that you can tie that to experiences that people have had in their childhood. So, and so I think that that's extremely important to understand in ourselves, rather than me sitting there. And I guess it also came from this. I'm sitting there going, 
why am I not able to take the same decisions that Monish Pabra is able to take? Why am I not able to develop the same degree of comfort? And when you ask your quest, the question enough, and he, he laughs, he says, yeah, I'm going to tell Guy Spear this idea and, and he's going to go into his bomb shelter. He calls it the bomb shelter. He called me up and he'll say, have you come out of the bomb shelter yet? And um, so asking that question, I started realizing that it's got to do with our very different childhood experiences. And, and possibly even before that, a very different approach to what life is and what the world is about. I think that if you, if you grow up in a Jewish environment or a Judeo-Christian environment even, um, there is history, there is tragedy. Uh, things unfold for the better or for the worse. But if you grow up in a, as I understand it, and I'm not claiming any um, uh, expertise here, there's, there's the idea in the Hindu world of reincarnation of souls and, and there's a circular life. To, history doesn't unfold towards some destination. Life just repeats itself. And maybe in a world where life just repeats itself endlessly, you have a different approach to money because it kind of comes and goes, whereas that's not the feeling. There's tragedy, there's loss, and then there's rebuilding. You try and hold on to it, something like that. But And it seems to me that if we understand all of the stuff behind all of those kind of psychological underpinnings and just the perspective of consolidating the person's balance sheet, um, we do better. Yeah.